Well, hello and welcome to Faith, Philosophy and Life with me, Mr. Shelton. It's great that you're back again. Uh, at the moment, we are looking at evil and suffering and religious responses to that from a philosophical viewpoint. If you've seen any of my uh, clips so far, then you'll know that we've covered the proofs for the existence of God. And then recently we've looked at the logical and evidential problem of suffering. And then last time looked at the free will defense, looking at Mackey and Augustine and Plantinga. Today we move on and we think more about process theology and Hicks soul-making theodicy as well, the Irenaean approach. So what we're going to do before we kick off big time is, so without any further ado, while I find the cat and chase it outside, here is our introductory sequence. <laughs> learning objective is to explore alternative explanations to evil and suffering avoiding the free will defense well we looked last time about why that wasn't such a great defense in some ways our learning of outcomes then it's going to be good if we can explain what the soul making and process theodicy is it's going to be great if we can explain what makes process theology an attractive solution to evil and suffering and even better if we can evaluate if you think that hick griffin or the free will defense is the best way of solving process theology and why. So we're going to start off with a little bit of drawing. We've got an overview of what we're looking at. We've got Hicks Soul Making Theodicy, a worksheet to do, a media clip. We're going to look at process theology and then we'll conclude with aggregates and an example essay for you to look at. Now, the first thing I would like to say is that there is an awful lot more than what I'm going to go through now, which is available on these topics. And I strongly recommend that you do some wider reading because this is this is really meant to be a recap and a fill in the blanks for those of you doing some revision. But please note that this is not sufficient for you. OK, so what you need is you need a pencil and a scrappy bit of paper because I'm going to ask you to draw something in a moment. At the end of each thing, you need to pause it and then do your drawing. We're talking no more than about 20 seconds of drawing. It really doesn't have to be a work of art. This is uh, an example that I found of a villain drawn by a child. You're not drawing that, but I thought it was a good example of what we're doing. So to start with, then I'd like you to draw uh, a being, an animal, a thing you can choose, which is able to go very fast. So pause this clip now and draw something that goes very fast. OK, not only does it need to go very fast, you now need to be able to make it to, to be able to fly. So I'd like you now to adapt your picture without removing anything, but add something to it to enable it to fly. OK, now you need to add something to it to enable it to swim or breathe underwater. And lastly, I'd like you to add something to it so that it can survive in the desert. OK, so I wonder what your diagram looks like. What I can say with complete certainty is it will have evolved over time and your diagram will have got better based on more and more information. That is the crux of what we're looking at with Hicks Soul Making Theodicy today. But before we do, let's just have a very quick recap on um, Augustine and the free will defense. So this is the free will defense. And we drew this diagram last time that at the start of time, there was no suffering according to the Bible. Um, Adam and Eve then uh, fall. They then 
rebel against God and that's where the concept of sin comes from so sin comes into the world and suffering does as a consequence of sin and you can see there that um, that sin just shoots up okay it then stays at the same level for the time that uh, the, the earth is in existence and then drops back down when Jesus returns at the end of time to resolve the issue of sin now Augustine would say that this is a soul deciding time whether you go to heaven or not is dependent now upon your belief in God and that is why suffering occurs suffering occurs because we have free will because we choose to do things that have an impact on us and an impact on others so there is sin and suffering in the world today or suffering and evil should I say because of what Adam and Eve did or representative of people rejecting God's rule over them but it is in this life that we get the opportunity to decide if we're going to believe in Jesus or not hence soul deciding because what happens in the next life depends on our decisions in this life then you get the Irenaean theodicy now this is uh, similar to John Hick's theodicy John Hick builds his soul making ideas on the Irenaeus theodicy and the Irenaeus theodicy suggests that suffering increases and the reason why suffering increases is that the world was never made perfect at the best of times so we improve as time goes on because of what happens around us refines us a bit like refining coal to make a diamond for example putting it under a pressured environment that's really what's happening and Irenaeus would call this a soul making time rather than Augustine's soul deciding times so this is uh, some information here I think would be very worth you having a read over so it goes over Irenaeus's soul making theodicy it's got Augustine's soul deciding theology and it introduces today Hick's veil of soul making which is say based on Irenaeus but it's more to do with the fact that Hick would believe that everyone gets to heaven at the end of time he is a universalist um, so therefore he has no issue with believing that that people won't get it right by the end of their lives but it is the idea that people will will ever ultimately get to heaven um, at some point in the future Irenaeus says that we have the effect of evil and suffering on us in order to help us become children of God rather than Augustine which says we are children of God um, but we need to decide if we're going to believe in that or not I suggest that you have a look at that I'm just going to move over to the side I suggest you pause it and make some notes of anything you may not already know we are going to look at John Hick uh, in quite a bit of detail now okay thank you for that so um, we've got we've had a concept now of what soul making is but we now need to do a little bit more work on that so I'm going to invite you to download this uh, worksheet now it is linked in the description of this clip and it is really helpful I think to have this because I'm going to talk you through information that you may put on this sheet and it should help give you a little bit of focus okay so I'm going to continue now as if you've got that sheet downloaded uh, and hopefully you have Okay, I've got some information on the screen as well that we're going to refer to as we go so Hicks started by saying that uh, the Augustinian theodicy is just not credible in fact he said as I've got on the sheet there that it is utterly unacceptable he says that the Genesis account is not scientific so the creation of the world according to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is not scientific and his reasoning for that is that they he claims that they're based on the Babylonian epics of creation so the Babylonian epics of creation were narratives that were written uh, earlier than the Bible of recorded accounts of Genesis 1 and they are very similar in a lot of ways of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 so they contain for example the flood which you find in Genesis 6 they contain the idea of diseases and natural disasters well they talk about diseases and natural disasters and they hadn't even occurred before people existed according to the Babylonian um, epics it talks about morally punishing punishing everyone for two people's mistakes sounds familiar with Adam and Eve it, it isn't what uh, God would do 
that's Hick's idea. Remember, Hick is a universalist. He believes that God loves everyone. Um, so if God created a perfect world with flawed creations in it, then God is not perfect. OK, so that's what Hick's starting point is. If God created a perfect world with flawed creation, then God just isn't perfect. So St. Irenaeus, for example, was a better starting point. He says that humans didn't fall. They didn't fall in the story of Adam and Eve. They, they, they didn't fall at all. They were just made not perfect. They had the capacity to be children of God, but that was only if they built themselves into becoming children of God. So, for example, parents love their children, or at least they should love their children. I, I do love my children. Humans are me, and the evidence of this is that relationship with God is similar to the way that children are with parents. So humans have to develop their relationships between each other. They grow. And if you've ever been in a relationship with someone, then you know that there are good days and bad days. And quite often it's the bad days that help you grow that relationship. Humans then are made into being in a relationship with God. They have the capacity to become children of God and they need bad things to happen to them in order for that relationship to grow. I can't fully protect my children from bad things that are going to happen to them. And neither should I, because it is that that's going to decide who they are. It's that that's going to add value to who they are. In the same way, Hick would argue that it is God who adds value to people because of suffering. And if we didn't have that suffering, if we lived in a hedonistic paradise where everything was great all the time, we wouldn't ever flex those muscles about what do we believe or what's our relationship with God like, because we'd never have a reason to develop that. So what then happens is Hick extends this process and he talks about how humans create and develop their children of God's creation and the human race as well. So he looks at Genesis 1.26 about humans being made in the image of God. And he says that, yes, humans have the capacity to be made in the image of God. We're not made in the image of God from the day that we're born, but we have the capacity to do that. And then he looks at what the word image means. And he comes up with two terms. He comes up with the bios and the zoe. Don't ask me why it's zoe. And if your name's zoe, well, that's brilliant for you. And if your name is not zoe, then don't worry about it. I don't know why zoe is chosen. But the bios then is the biological likeness that people have of God. Now, he divorces that from what is understood by image of God here, because he says that the image is the Zoe, the perfect personal life of an eternal worth that humans have. So it's the eternal spiritual element, which is the Zoe. That's what the image of God is. And the only Zoe that really has been that's visible is Jesus. So Jesus is Zoe. Yeah, that might get a little bit confusing, but it's that idea that Jesus is the, the perfect example that we need to emulate and copy. Hick says that we all develop and we all eventually will have a personal relationship with God, bringing many sons to glory, a quote from the Bible, and that we are fellow heirs of Christ, another uh, quote from the Bible. See, as I said already, Hick does believe that the human race will respond freely to God everyone will be saved. He is a universalist. God is infinitely persuasive and has many lifetimes in order to achieve this. That's not to say that Hick believes in reincarnation. Uh, there is a belief that, that there is an extended lifetime after death where people are still able to make those choices to believe in Jesus. So there is definitely a Christian twist to what Hick talks about, but he does believe that, that God is uh, more forgiving insofar as God gives unlimited attempts for people to get into the correct relationship with him. Augustine then, his world is soul deciding, whereas Hick is soul making. In fact, it's often called veil of soul making because it's this idea that things will continue. Everyone, though, has a free choice in order to have a relationship with God. But again, given an infinite amount of time, everyone will make that choice. He says that there needs to be doubt in order to believe in God. If there wasn't any doubt, then there wouldn't be any belief because you wouldn't have any trust. Therefore, 
the world needs to be a world of moral and natural evils because it is that that helps us develop that trust. There are a couple of things, though, that um, Hick addresses. The first thing is he talks about animal suffering, because you might say, well, animal suffering's got really not to do with humans getting in a good relationship with God. Well, he basically sums up by saying that animals are there in order for humans not to get too full of themselves. If you see an animal suffer, you remember that we also suffer. If you see an animal, then we realise that we've got responsibility for that. So it's to do with this idea that, that animals are there to try and help us understand our role. There are some pointless evils, he would say. Remember William Rowe's example of a fawn dying in a forest and the evidential problem of evil. There is a little bit of that of one of the crash courses, but I'm not going to show you that today. And then lastly, he says that um, it does not justify the extent of evil in the world. It just explains that there is some. So Hick isn't trying to hear to say that there is um, a reason why there's so much suffering in the world. He's just simply saying we acknowledge that there is some suffering in the world. And yes, there is some. And that's all that Hick really is trying to talk about. We need that evil. We need that suffering in order for us to develop our relationship with God. Now, I've got a link here, which is uh, http colon slash slash tiny dot cc slash hick. And that's a, uh, an extract from his writings, from Hick's writings, which is worth having a read over as well. However, before we get too much uh, further and move on at strengths and weaknesses and how I think you're best to look at that, there is a random YouTube clip that I think that you would benefit from watching to save you listening to me much longer. So over to you, random YouTube clip. Go. So remember when you were a kid and you lost something or you got hurt or like me, you always came second in cross country because you just could not beat your exceptionally well-named mate, Ben Warrior. And there was always an adult, dad, who said something like, don't worry, son, it builds character. Well, John Hicks' version of the Irenaean Theodicy is like that. It's about character building. He says that suffering builds character, it builds the soul. Remember, of course, that a theodicy is a way of justifying God in the face of evil in the world. It's a way of saying that God can be, can be omnibenevolent and omnipotent uh, and allow evil to exist. So, John Hick tells us that evil exists because it puts us through a process of moral growth. And if God intervened in this, then it would completely undermine our freedom and our free will. In fact, he takes it further by saying that God created his own existence um, to an epistemic distance. So what he meant was he made his own existence somewhat vague because if we were 100% sure that God was watching us, then we would be good through fear, like Paul, big brother is watching you kind of thing. But if God's existence is somewhat vague and we live in an imperfect world, then any virtues we develop become truer. It's not a great word, but it'll work. John Hicks said that if we were born with this sort of innate goodness, this whole idea that God made us perfect beings, then any virtues we had would be the virtues of robots. They would be basically valueless. So um, what that means is without freedom to make choices, humans wouldn't be able to develop those key virtues of love, compassion, grace and kindness. Now remember our focus in class is to explore the ways in which a religious person might be inspired to strive against the existence of suffering and evil in the world. And that's what we will look at in the next few videos. Okay, okay so thank you for that. So uh, hopefully you found that helpful. Now what we need to do is we do need to look at strengths and weaknesses. Now I haven't got time to go over that with you guys. Uh, as I said, I am trying to cover a lot of material today. Um, but if you look at page 75 or 76, if you have this book by John Fry, uh, that gives you a really good summary of strengths and weaknesses. So have a quick glance over that so you understand what is good about John Hick and his soul making theology and what is less good because you could be asked directly about this one. So during this lesson, then we said we'll look at soul making and process theology, and we've looked now at the soul making theology by John Hick. And we're now going to look at process theology as well. Uh, process theology is something very, very different than um, Irenaeus and Hick. However, 
uh, it fits with this because last time we looked at free will defense and it's another approach that isn't the free will defense. So it's always good to understand how things would fit in. This is an AO1 question again at an AQA level. However, it would be similar for other exam boards. So we're going to look at how, explaining how the concept of God is understood in process theology. So process theology interweaves with quite a lot of this course in a lot of different ways. Um, so this is merely a bit of an introduction, but it is a fundamental introduction to things that we're going to look at. So what I'd like you to do now is uh, we have a quick introduction to process theology. Uh, random YouTube click. Three, two, one, go. Yeah, process theologians have a lot of different ways of explaining process theology, and so it's kind of hard to put it all in one little nutshell. But typically speaking, process theologians emphasize that existence is in process, that things are not little bits of matter bouncing around already settled, but that there's an ongoingness to time. And most importantly, perhaps, God is a part of the ongoingness of time. So most process folks think that time is real for God and creation, that there's an interrelatedness, that each individual, whether it's a small little entity or a very complex elephant, is interdependent and interrelated with its environment and its past. They also, most process thinkers following Whitehead want to talk about uh, existence as being more event oriented or the technical language is uh, an actual occasion, but it's more experiential than it is little bits of matter or mechanistic sorts of ways. And the process tradition wants to avoid any sort of hint of determinism by saying that there's agency or in complex creatures freedom, that there's um, some sort of indeterminateness even at the most basic levels of existence. So there's a lot of ways to define process thought, but I would say the ongoingness of time, the genuine freedom or agency in the world, the interdependency or interrelatedness, and that the world itself is made up of events or moments or drops of experience. Um, I've got a few notes for you to make as we talk them through it. Hopefully you found that useful. So process theology comes from um, Griffin. Uh, Griffin takes the work of Whitehead, W-H-I-T-E-H-E-A-D. Uh, and Griffin uh, builds on Whitehead's ideas. So he basically starts by saying that he doesn't accept that creation out of nothing, creation ex nihilo. Um, he says that when God created the world in Genesis 1, he didn't create it from nothing. He said it was a mistranslation of the text. So this is Genesis chapter 1. Um, and it, it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now Griffin suggests that this is a mistranslation, partly due to punctuation and partly due to words. So this is his suggested translation. In the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, the earth being without form and void, and the darkness being upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moving over the face of the waters. Okay, I'll read that again. In the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth, the earth being without form and void, and the darkness being upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moving over the face of the waters. You may have picked up on this. In the beginning of God's creating. Okay, so God isn't creating the heavens and the earth. They already exist. They're already there without form and they're in a void so there's a chaos already the darkness upon the face of the deep so there's a chaos which god basically molds and brings together and then he starts to push creation into the world that we're in now now it's very interesting to note that whitehead wrote this uh, between 1861 and 1947 process theology stems from this work so Griffin is really building on the back of an established idea at this point. So Griffin's suggestion is that God 
twists pre-existing matter. A little bit like the Big Bang Theory or evolution, where things change slightly. And that very much fits in with what we're thinking. He would say that the universe was uncreated and eternal. So it wasn't that God brought the universe into being. The universe already existed. There was unformed matter, which is described as chaos. So God takes that matter and moulds it, brings it together like you get a bit of plasticine and you start to grow it. Like at the start when we had the, uh, the little character that you drew and then John Hick would suggest with that that uh, experiences happen to mould that character into the final form. Well, with regards to Griffin, that's the idea that, that God just pushes it and changes it slightly wherever it is possible to do so. You see, God was there and God is part of the universe. Um, God is in, in the universe as well. So it's a pantheistic idea that God is within everything around us. This is the key, though. God persuaded matter from chaos. If it didn't already exist, God could not have brought it into existence. So God persuaded it out of chaos into a structure that evolved into what we are now. And it takes the mind of God to seek the change in the universe. In fact, Griffin is quite happy to accept that it's taken 13.7 billion years since the Big Bang to arrange it in the order that it is now. So this is a little bit of analysis then. There's some ideas that quantum mechanics could support this. So quantum mechanics, the idea that um, there's there's universes around us and, and matter can appear and, uh, and dematerialize and materialize somewhere else. And, and this is potentially where the Big Bang came from, uh, that matter could have come from somewhere else and appeared. Now, there is scientific suggestion that this is in fact more than just a theory however at this point it's still called a theory griffin could be right about the translation genesis 1 uh, there are similar texts as we've talked about um, and it does explain away evil remember we're on a unit about evil and suffering why is there evil in the universe well as we'll go on to think about it's because god actually can't do anything about it god isn't omnipotent uh, that's an absolutely fundamental belief of process theology. If you don't have that, weren't aware of that, make a note of that. God is not omnipotent and therefore God is not got the power to get rid of it. And therefore evil happens because God hasn't got the ability to stop it. OK, so so far then we've thought a little bit about process theology. We need to really focus in on that a little bit more now. So. Let me just start with these two images. At the top of the screen is the Roman god Janus. Now, Janus is an interesting god because as you see, he's got two heads, one facing the past and one facing the future. Evil brings upset, good brings happiness. And this is built into nature. What this shows is that God, at least in even process theology, has an understanding that there is evil in the universe as well as good. It's not that God doesn't want there to be uh, perfect good in process theology, it's that God is aware that in order to have good, there is also evil, hence the two-headedness of God. So it's not ideal in process theology, but it is a fact of life because God is not omnipotent, he's unable to do something about it. So therefore, um, the picture behind me directly then is taken from Schillinger's List, which some of you may have seen by Steven Spielberg. It's about the Holocaust. So the Holocaust, he would say, is God's fault. And the reason why it's God's fault is that God started the whole process off. He didn't have to. God didn't have to decide that um, creating sentient beings that had the capacity to love was a good thing to do. But he did it anyway. So consequently, you can blame evil on God, not because God created evil, but God willed things into existence, which he didn't have to will into existence in the first place. Let me read you this from Griffin. This is a direct quote. Uh, the question as to whether God is indictable is to be answered in terms of the question as to whether the positive values that are possible in our world are valuable enough to be worth the risk of negative experiences which have occurred and the even greater horrors 
which stand before us as real possibilities for the future. Should God, for the sake of avoiding the possibility of persons such as Hitler and the horrors of Auschwitz, have precluded the possibility of Jesus, Gautama, Socrates, Confucius, Moses, Mendelssohn, El Greco, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Florence Nightingale, Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, Chief J Joseph, Chief Se Seattle, Alfred North Whitehead, John F. Kennedy, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sojourner Truth, Helena Keller, Louis Armstrong, Albert Einstein, Reynold Nubia, Carol Canning, Margaret Mead, and millions of others marvellous human beings, well known alike, who have lived on the face of this earth. In other words, should God, for the sake of avoiding man's inhumanity to man, have avoided humanity or some co comparably complex species altogether? Only those who could sincerely answer this question affirmatively could indict the God of process theology on the basis of the evil in the world. So his point's very clear. In order to have good, you need to be aware that there's going to be evil. However, Griffin is very clear that the amount of good, both historic, present and future, will outweigh the amount of evil. Let me say that again. The amount of good, both historic, present and future, will outweigh the amount of evil. That does lead to an idea, though, that God is only really looking after those that are uh, that succeed, that have the strength to continue. And that is definitely a criticism of process theology. OK, so in his book, Encountering Evil, Live Options in Theodicy, which is what Griffin's book is called, he also wrote this. I cannot imagine that I would ever conclude that the evils of life have been so great that it would not it would have been better had life never emerged or that the evils of human life, so horrendous as they've been, and quite possibly the worst is still to come, are such that it would never have been better to have a human life never created. So again, that's just confirming what we've just talked about. Behind me is an image of Thor's Rock, which is fairly close to where I live. It's a famous place that's potentially where Vikings hold a council when they were used to run Britain. It's an aggregate. A rock is an aggregate. It's a thing. Uh, in the same way a plant is an aggregate, it's a thing. And in fact, if you can, you can divide the world into things and things with a soul. Now, the idea that um, Griffin comes up with is there's only humans that have souls. So animals do not have souls. Uh, plants do not have souls. The table that you might be leaning against or, or the chair you might be sitting in does not have a soul. God is unable in process theology to influence things without a soul and when i say influence i mean nudge slightly nudge in a tiny tiny way because don't forget god's not omnipotent and if god's not omnipotent he doesn't have the power to control much at all he might be intrinsically entwined with the universe but that doesn't mean that he has power over it so griffin splits things into aggregates and things with a soul and it's really important to note that there are certain things that God just can't influence. So cancer, for example, is a thing without a soul. Therefore, God can't nudge that and cannot change that because he's unable to do so. Whereas a person, he might have the opportunity to influence. And so the aggregates and things with a soul is another idea in process theology, which is worthy of you investigating a little bit more. Um, bodies of water, another example of an aggregate. It's just too little. So what it means then is that God cannot stop a tsunami because that's an aggregate. God cannot stop a car from hurting you because that's an aggregate. So you might then start to ask the question, so what's the point of God? And that is probably one of the biggest flaws in process theology that there is. It's really good at explaining that God's not powerful enough to try and stop evil and suffering. I get that argument. That's a really strong argument. However, it's not a strong argument when you start to think about belief. So the questions you might start to ask yourself is, does a non-omnipotent God not deserve worship? Because if you're praying to a God who's not omnipotent, why would you bother? It might be omnibenevolent, but I might love people, but it doesn't mean I can help them at all, because I might not be strong enough or powerful enough to do that. I might know something's happening, omniscience could still come into play, but if again, if I can't do anything about that, there's absolutely no point. 
He also asked the question, can an omnipotent God do evil? So process theology doesn't indicate that it has to be an omnibenevolent God, even though that's the implication of what Griffin might say. But does an omnibenevolent God, are they able to do evil? A question then that needs to be posed is what poses the biggest issue about God and evil and suffering? Think about everything we've looked at. Is it omnipotence? Is it omnibenevolence or is it omniscience? If you remove one of those, so in Griffin's world, if you removed omnipotence, he would say God could still be loving and know everything. And actually, maybe it's the omnipotence angle that causes the issues when it comes to evil and suffering. And then the last question that you need to consider is why may God allow evil and suffering? And that is obviously a really big question for you to consider and to think about. So just when we come into conclusion now, because we've covered an awful lot in this session, I do appreciate if you've made it this far, you should really give yourself a pat on the back. So we've said we're to explore alternative explanations to evil and suffering, avoiding the free will defense. And we said it'd be good if you could explain what the soul making and process theology is. We said it would be great if you could explain why process theology is an attractive solution to the problem of evil and suffering. And you can see if you can remove God's omnipotence and God just tweaks things because he's not able to make massive differences, you can see how that's a really attractive solution to the problem of evil and suffering. And lastly, we said it'd be great if you can evaluate if you think that Hick, Griffin or the free will defense is the best way of solving process theology and why. And that's where I want to sort of leave us today. Um, so for those of you that did uh, see this book previously, it's The Philosophy of Religion by John Hick. It's a really helpful book. It's got a really good section in uh, about process theology. Uh, I'd strongly recommend that you have a read of that. But what I'm going to share with you now is an essay written by one of my students. And my question to you is, could you improve this and how would you improve this? Because I think it's pretty good, to be perfectly honest with you, hence why I'm sharing it with you. It's quite a lengthy essay. It's an AO2 evaluation essay. So I'm going to put it on the screen. Uh, I suggest that you pause it, read it and continue. And, and then there, there's four slides of, of answer here. Uh, and it's talking about the question of, the Augustinian approach to suffering is the best response there is to it. So it really goes over everything we've looked at. So I'm going to go now. I'm going to leave this on the screen and then just flick over. Uh, May I hope that you're all well and um, stay safe, wash hands. And I'm going to see you after Easter. So I'll give you a week and a bit off without me. God bless you.